Hey there, creative coders. This is Benjamin D. Whiting, and welcome back to the Super Collider segment of Null State's interactive digital art tutorial series. Last week, we took a look at Super Collider syntax, and this week we'll be going over using Super Collider's robust documentation, passing arguments into Super Collider classes, as well as interpreter and environmental variables. Let's get started by booting the server. Until now, we've been instancing sound generating functions with the play method to hear sound, and using the command period keystroke combination, or control period if you're on Windows or Linux, to stop playback. By the way, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to feel that the 440 hertz sine tone is overstaying its welcome. Let's listen to something different, shall we? Here's a sawtooth wave with middle C as its fundamental pitch. It's still only coming out of the left channel, however. While there are better ways of doing this, one simple way of ensuring a function will output across both stereo channels is to append the instance method dot dupe to the ugen class. Dot dupe, short for duplicate, will make a carbon copy of some output, in this case an audio rate data stream. Since the sound is already playing out of the left channel, SuperCollider will automatically perform something called multi-channel expansion upon the signal and output the copy over the right channel. As I'm sure this comes as no surprise to you by this point, there is an episode dedicated to multi-channel expansion planned for the not too distant future. Once you're ready to stop enjoying this glorious sound, press command period, control period on Windows or Linux. Let's take a quick moment to go over some important functionality in the Super Collider IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. Place your cursor somewhere on the class name Saw, you don't even have to highlight it, and press Command-D or Control-D in Windows and Linux. This key command will bring up the relevant help file in the help browser corresponding to whatever component your cursor is on which is a very useful tool, even now as recent versions of the Super Collider IDE include miniature help dialog boxes along with its autocomplete feature. Alternatively, you can look up the help pages by pressing Shift-Command-D or Shift-Control-D and typing in whatever you want to look up. So now we're looking at the main help page for SAW. As we could hear for ourselves, SAW is described as a band-limited sawtooth wave generator. Now let's take a look at what's listed by class method.ar. We can see three arguments, freak, short for frequency, mole, or multiply, and add, or add. We set our frequency with the first argument. In our case, we chose 261, which is approximately middle C on the piano. In the mole slot, we see 0.2, which means that the amplitude of the resulting waveform is multiplied by 0.2. We don't include a third argument as we're not looking to offset the amplitude by any given amount. In fact, it's typically not advisable to add values to waveforms that are meant to be audiated, as human beings don't typically detect offset psychoacoustically. Nevertheless, there will be plenty of times where add will come in handy, especially when we use oscillators as controllers for other unit generators. Those of you who have been watching since episode one may now be thinking, but Benjamin, why didn't you proceed these values with their corresponding argument labels like you did in your Hello World example? Fortunately, I have a good answer for that. While one is free to include these labels whenever instancing a class, they are only required when one wishes to declare them out of order. Let's quickly look up SINOSC. I wanted to play a sine tone at 440 Hz, A440 for those of you accustomed to playing in orchestral settings. And seeing that's the default value for frequency, I chose not to type that in. Phase shift doesn't matter, so I could safely skip over that too. The only value that concerned me was mole, and while I could have typed it out like so, I felt that notating it like this was more pedagogically illustrative. 
Incidentally, integers and floats are treated as objects belonging to the class simple number in SuperCollider, and as such can be the recipient of instance methods of that class. Returning to our sawtooth wave, there may be many of you who feel that dealing directly in hertz, as well as amplitude multiplication, isn't the most intuitive way to express one's sonic wishes. Let's touch upon two instance methods of simple number, .midi-cps and .db-amp. As a rule of thumb, SuperCollider expects frequency values passed into classes to be expressed in hertz, or cycles per second. MIDI-CPS is an instance method of simple number that converts a MIDI value into cycles per second. Just typing out 60.MIDI-CPS for a second, we can confirm that it is indeed very close to 261 hertz. Therefore, we can effectively replace our cycles per second value in our example like so. You might have already guessed this, but .dbamp takes a decibel full scale, or dbfs, value and converts it into a float that is appropriate for a mole or add argument, where 0 is negative infinity dbfs and 1 is 0 dbfs. 0 0.2 is very close to negative 14 dbfs, so we can express the mole argument in the following way. Some of you might prefer using function call notation instead, like you can see here. These conversion instance methods can be useful for those who are used to thinking in MIDI values or who want to ensure that the sound you're producing adheres to equal temperament and those who prefer the dbfs scale as found on digital audio equipment such as mixers and the like. Finally, both of these instance methods have counterparts that work in the opposite way, namely .cpsmidi and .ampdb. Until now, we've been instancing sound generating functions with the play method to hear sound and using the command period keystroke combination or control period if you're on Windows or Linux, to stop playback. This works well enough when prototyping a single function, but what does one do when playing two or more functions at once and wishing to stop playback of one sound? Let's return to our example from earlier. While the sawtooth wave is playing, enter and execute the following code. Press command or control period to stop. What you've just heard was a triangle wave oscillator eugen outputting an E, or a major third above middle C, at a slightly lower amplitude than that of the sawtooth wave playing a middle C. By the way, as a quick reminder, if you want to play both bits of code simultaneously, then all you need to do is enclose both lines between parentheses, like so and hit command return or control enter on Windows and Linux. One neat trick is to ensure that auto completion of bracketing enclosures is turned on. You can achieve this by accessing the preferences dialog box, selecting editor and then behavior, and checking the box saying auto insert matching parentheses brackets quotes. Then highlighting the code you wish to enclose, including the line immediately preceding and following, and then depressing the open parenthesis key. SuperCollider will then automatically and neatly enclose that code in parentheses. No need to go down to the end and insert the closing parenthesis yourself. So, command period of course stops both sounds, but what if we only wanted to stop the sawtooth wave? We would need some way to refer to that sound generating function memory. One can't simply enter the same code again with an instance method telling it to stop, as SuperCollider would instance that code as a new function and think you're referring to that instead. Short of looking up that function's uniquely assigned node ID on the server and issuing an open sound control or OSC message directly, telling it to free that node, which while useful in certain fringe cases is ridiculously overkill for hours, one must assign these functions to variables. 
For those of you who haven't done any computer programming before, you may nevertheless remember something called a variable from your high school or college algebra classes. In algebra, a variable, such as x, can act as a receptacle for a value yet to be plugged into any given formula. Variables in computer programming are similar in that one can conceptualize them as labeled containers that store data. These containers, and the data stored inside of them, can then be referenced throughout one's program, and the state of the data within these containers can be changed at any time, hence them being variable. Variables can be either local or global in scale, meaning they can be accessed only by a function or other grouping of code in which they are declared, thus protecting them from accidentally being overwritten or corrupted by other processes, or they are freely made available to any code running in a particular session. Today we will be focusing on the latter of these two variable types, of which SuperCollider presents us with two very similar subsets, interpreter variables and environmental variables. SuperCollider's interpreter variable collection is a set of 26 variables, each corresponding to a letter of the Roman alphabet, that are instanced upon booting SuperCollider. These variables can be referenced, as well as altered, by any code anywhere in one's program. As such, they are invaluable receptacles into which one can store their sound-generating functions. Interpreter variables can be set with the following syntax, x equals value, where x is any letter of the alphabet, including x itself. Here, I'll be setting x to 5. As one might expect, when I type the following, x plus 4, and evaluate it, 9 is posted in the post window. Of course, using interpreter variables to store simple numbers is a rather large waste of their potential, not to mention irrelevant for our needs. Let's now revisit the two functions we've written above, setting the sawtooth wave to x and the triangle wave to y. Now let's stop the sawtooth wave. We can achieve this by making use of the dot free instance method of function. You might have heard that its cutoff was a little bit abrupt. Let's stop the triangle wave with the dot release method instead. The difference between dot free and dot release is subtle, but nevertheless important. Dot free immediately frees the node from memory, stopping all code associated with a particular node in its tracks. It's useful when prototyping, but not at all in performance, as its abruptness invariably produces some sort of click or artifact. Dot release makes use of an argument called fade time, which defaults to 0.1 seconds. One can specify a different fade time by passing an integer or float into the method as an argument. Fade time can be applied to the dot play method as well though one will need to use the fadeTime argument tag as it isn't the first argument of that instance method. One word of caution. Both dot .play and dot .release refer to the same value in memory for their respective fadeTime arguments, so what you enter using dot .play will automatically be used for dot .release. Therefore, if you want a different length of time for fading in than you do for fading out, you'll have to specify different fade times for both. One important caveat with interpreter variables is that, while technically one can use any letter of the alphabet as an interpreter variable, the variable s is reserved by the language to refer to the default server. It is considered very unwise to overwrite its default behavior. If you do happen to overwrite it, however, there are two ways to restore it. Either rebooting the interpreter, which is cumbersome but can be achieved like this, or the far handier, The former resets everything back to its default state, 
thus effectively clearing Super Collider's memory, while the latter does nothing but restore S back to its rightful role as representative of the default server. An alternative to using interpreter variables as global variables is environmental variables. These differ from the previous category in the following ways. They must be preceded by a tilde, they can be labeled by any number or combination of alphanumeric characters, though the first character after the tilde must be a lowercase letter, and interior white space is not allowed, and they are environment dependent, which is irrelevant for the time being. Using environmental variables in lieu of interpreter variables to store sound generating functions allows us to give descriptive names to our sounds. We will, for the most part, be making use of environmental variables instead of interpreter variables in this tutorial, as their lack of being limited to one alphabetic character helps to facilitate clarity in one's code. Okay, this about wraps it up for our episode on Super Collider class arguments and global variables. Next week we'll be exploring the use of local variables, without which sound design of any complexity is virtually impossible to attain. We will also discuss creating arguments to use in our own functions that will allow external manipulation of our synthesized sounds. In the meantime, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel to show your support for more interactive digital music and art content from us at Null State. Also, make sure to check out our Facebook page and webpage to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events, workshops, and concerts. See you next time!